Okay, so we finished looking at and overviewing the mind-blowing abundance of what's behind us, and now we're looking at the bed that's here right in front of me. We started out the season with potatoes on this side. It was ridiculously successful. Um, probably in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 kilos of potatoes from the dozen plants that were here. We've moved now to lettuces and onions, and you can see the lettuces. Look at them. The ones that haven't been hit by wireworm are doing great. In the middle bed, we had uh, onions and carrots. We've switched now to cabbage family and kale. They're doing great. And this row, we tried the lettuce. It didn't work out great. We moved to beets and interplanted with bush beans, and we just finished harvesting the bush beans today. I showed those to you earlier, and the beets are taken off great. So I'm just going to come in and do a little quick look at the planting plan again. So again, you've got kind of a record of what we did and how it worked. So we had the potatoes, did amazing, and now those potatoes have mixed to onions and lettuce for the winter. We had carrots and onions, which did great. The parsnips didn't exist. They just didn't do well at all. And now we've moved that to cabbage and kale. The mixed greens failed completely, so we went to beets and bush beans. They've both done great. And the beets are now the size of like softball, hard balls moving on to softballs and the beans we just finished harvesting. So this bed is just going great and it's gonna get a row cover shortly and that'll be an another video coming up soon. And that'll just protect it from the elements a little bit more for the winter as the cold season comes on. So now we're just gonna pop over to the final bed here and take a peek at it. Okay, so we're onto the final bed. Whenever I get to this final bed, I start to laugh because of the scale of everything that's in the cabbage family growing in here. There's gigantic heads of cabbage forming in here. We've already pulled out two big heads of cauliflower that we've shown you. And remember, up until 20 days ago, right in this corner was a cantaloupe melon, and it produced 10 cantaloupes that were bigger or as big as my hands reach around. And then right next to it in the other corner was a zucchini plant, uh, a golden, Yukon Gold it was called, and it produced so many beautiful zucchinis through the season. So those have both been uprooted, the soil's been covered, and the cabbage family's going nuts. Red kales, cabbages, the cauliflowers have been host, already harvested, and then under here you can see the green onions are going amazing. I made fresh spaghetti sauce uh, with our tomatoes and herbs last night, and I just got to go along this bed. I pulled out fresh basil, fresh parsley, fresh thyme, fresh oregano, and then fresh green onions. It was incredible. So all these are being kind of shielded in a good way from the intensive heat and also from the cold at night by the cabbage family. They look very synergistic here. So just a little wrap up review on this planting bed here. Where are we? Okay, take a look at this. So we started out with the chard and the greens on the other side of the bed and the tat soy was in here with the chard and the greens. It's done amazing, it just keeps on going, and we even got to save seed from the tat soy. We didn't do any turnips. That was a request of someone, and I don't like turnips, so I didn't want to grow any. Cabbage and broccoli's done amazing. And at this end, we didn't actually have, sorry, not cabbage and broccoli, cabbage and cauliflower's done amazing. And then herbs all along, and we had, as we noted, the melon and the zucchini squash here. So. Like, how much better can you get than all that, right? It's just been fantastic. This bed, I think, is going to do really well right through the winter. So let's now just do a wrap-up back where we started out and just talk through a few of the details as the garden is kind of coming to a close, even though, as I say, it's still mind-blowingly abundant and there's still more production happening. We are moving into fall and winter months. So let's just do a little wrap-up look at that. I want you to look at the ground cover, because in a moment, as we wrap up, we're going to talk about weeds as one of our topics. I want you to notice here, there's none. Now parts of the garden during the season, yes, I've brought in a bit more cardboard and a bit more mulch and I've covered them up, especially if there was thistles, which hurt my bare feet. But in this area, I haven't done one thing. No thistles came through. I'm curious to know down here, it's very moist. There's soil that's growing for sure. I never put soil here, but it's, it's produced soil, so it's gonna need another covering. But I haven't had to do any weeding. And you know what's happened as a result of this? Slugs won't cross this. And in my area of the world, if you have slug cover and they can kind of stay underneath it and stay shaded, they will move into your bed and they will eat and eat and eat. But because of this barren area that's like a no slime zone for slugs, it's kind of scratchy and brittle with pine needles and bark and pine cones and twigs. No slugs. I honestly, truthfully, in my other gardens, I have slugs. This garden, I have any slugs. So this perimeter of bark chips has been amazing, not just at holding down the weeds, but at keeping out the most prolific pest that I struggle with. 
Now let's just continue looking at a few more of those details. Okay, so I just did that little uh, short punctuated comment on the perimeter ground cover and how it affected very positively the weeds being completely controlled and the pests being completely controlled as well. I just want to make sure you can see that. So the weeds in the perimeter area, we put down cardboard and we put down bark chips and that completely eliminated any challenge with weeds in the perimeter in the alleys or the rows. And I've already shown you through this video at 112 days after planting, the cardboard and the coffee sacks between the drip lines and between the veggie rows have completely eliminated any need for weeding at all. This has truly been a whole season, 112 days, no weeding. You know what the key is? Keep it covered even when it's not growing a crop that you planned. If you plant nothing, you'll grow anything unless you keep it covered. You want to control what you're planting, presumably, but if you plant nothing and leave it exposed, then all the seeds of all the weeds blowing around will end up in your garden and you'll have a big crop of things you weren't planning on growing. So as soon as you're done growing something, cover it up right away, just like I showed you when I uh, uprooted my, um, the stem of my cucumber plant, I immediately put a coffee sack down. So weeds in the perimeter and in the beds, keep the soil covered. When you have the weeds covered, as we do, we remove a lot of the pest problems because you remove a lot of the habitat for the pests you don't want. The little critters like worms, I'm loving that they're underneath the ground cover. That's been fantastic. The other two pests that I struggle with here, much bigger than slugs that I've already mentioned in the previous clip, is rabbits and deer. So I put up that netting that's around the fence. It's about two meters high. And the goal was that with just that wire that runs around the top, like a shower curtain rod, that netting would be very lightweight, easy to pull back when you wanted to come and go or move a wheelbarrow through, which it's been perfect, and it would keep out the deer. It's absolutely 100% done that. I just want to point out to you, and I'm actually going to turn the, um, the camera so you just understand what I'm talking about here, but just over here, you should be able to see that now. Just over here on this side is a big plum tree and this plum tree is just outside the garden and there's been a male deer, a buck, that has spent the summer living at night under that garden. I see fresh deer crap almost every morning and he's eaten some of the low hanging leaves on the plum tree. So if this garden could be accessed by a deer, my goodness, the guy who lives two, three meters away at night would have come in here there hasn't been a deer in here once, so he decided he was not going to try jumping two meters, though perhaps if he wanted to, he could have. We've eliminated that. So now I'll just go back to here and we'll just talk for a second further about the issue of the, um, the rabbits. Yeah, the rabbits. Oh, we're going to go a little higher on that. So rabbits are tough for me in my area because they know how to dig and burrow through things. The good thing to remember on rabbits dealing with pests, they can't jump over stuff very well. They, maybe they could, but they didn't get told by their parents. So if you have a perimeter that's just um, 40 or 60 centimeters tall, rabbits, if they are unable to dig under, they won't try to climb or jump over. So it's usually right around the perimeter as a skirt that you need something. And I found this nylon fencing, a rabbit, if it's motivated, can chew through it. I've only seen that happen in one place. And I've seen a deer in, uh, a deer, a rabbit in this garden a couple times, but for the most part, you know, the losses are so minimal, I can't really tell where the rabbit's eating. As I told you earlier, I'm giving away bags of food to friends and neighbors all the time, so a rabbit coming in and sharing a little bit of the wealth, not a problem. It's the slugs when I first planted that I needed to make sure were out, they were, and to make sure big animal like a deer didn't get in, and that worked perfectly. So that's been the issues I would have wanted to address, and they've been addressed beautifully. Okay, so the final two topics we wanted to cover were water and seeds. So it's been a fairly dry summer where I live and it's pretty common where I live that we have 100 days, usually the months of July, August, September, no rain. 100 days without rain means you need to have a way to water. And if you use a sprinkler overhead water, you waste a lot of water and you water a lot of areas you don't want growing like weeds or grasses that you don't want invading into your plants. That's why I've urged from the start that you do drip irrigation 30 minutes maybe twice a week, that's about all I've needed. If you have really tight rows, you might have to hand water the little starts when they get going, and after that, the drip's just been perfect. Turning on one tap and your whole garden when it's this size gets watered, so easy. And then the final thing, seeds. I've shown you now different things that you can collect seeds from, and there's a lot of plants in this garden that you can collect seeds from, and we've collected seeds from chard in this garden, from the pole beans that are behind me, 
and also from the tatsoi. And if you wanted to be patient, you could also save from your onions. In any onion in the family, when it has a big flower on top, you can save the seeds from that when they dry out. And I've got videos under sustainable stace about that. Beets as well are beautiful to save seeds from. Again, just let the leaves grow. The energy from the bulb will go up. It'll take a year from when you could have harvested it to wait until you can harvest the seeds. So seeds are another great way. So that is a wrap on looking at our big planting plan. We started out with this piece of cardboard 112 days ago. We've broken it down and gone through what happened. And for the most part, just like nature, some stuff wasn't predictable, but most of it was. And it's been amazing. Mind-blowing backyard abundance. Stick around for the next couple of videos, which will be a row cover for the one bed, planting garlic behind me. That'll be a wrap. Woo.